My childhood minister, the Reverend Dr. Forrest Church, wrote that religion is the response to being alive and having to die. Religion is, be, is the response of being alive and having to die. But if part of what being religious means is reconciling being alive and having to die, grappling with death, the inevitability of it, the meaning of it, the process of it, the spiritual work of it, I'm really struck by how little Unitarian Universalists talk about it. I mean, almost not at all. So much so that I think we have almost no comprehension how diverse our perspectives on death are. They're shared with me sometimes when I'm preparing and accompanying people, members, into death, where they're sharing their grief at a loved one who passed. Some of us say that when we die, it's just an annihilation. There's just nothingness where there had been fullness. Others of us believe 100%, feel very, very confident that, we'll, that they will see the loved ones that crossed over into death again. Other of us believe that it's some kind of transformation into another form of beingness, while others believe in reincarnation. It's all here, that diversity and perspectives in the room, how much richer we would be if we talked about it. So I want to open that door so we can talk about that final journey and better prepare for it. I want to say that this journey is um, not an easy one. And I, all of us here, in one form or another, has, have been touched by death. And I want to hold those of you who have had that collision with a sudden, early, unexpected death. And those of you who have experienced the long and heartbreaking slow death to memory loss, unconsciousness, incapacitation. But I want to talk about, and I will say our hearts grieve with you on both those ends. We could feel with empathy, sometimes knowing ourselves, how difficult both of those are. But I want to talk about the work that we can do when we have a more natural death or just the preparation we could do knowing that we will encounter death in many different ways in our own lives. Ram Dass talked about how accompanying someone who is dying is like being a midwife. And when I was the intern minister here about 12 years ago, my mother was dying. And over about a six week period, I was like a midwife to her dying process. I spent about four of those six weeks out there flying back for these Sunday services. And I accompanied her in mind and body and spirit, often caring for her and her body like a parent cares for a young child, making sure that she's clean, that she has water and food and is comfortable. She often talked about that how I cared for her like a midwife or a mother that I was not yet to be. And so I guess I could call this sermon everything I need to know about how to die I learned from my mother. My mother showed me that when death approaches, your body leads the way. I think one reason why we push thoughts of death off is that we can't comprehend going from this level of savoring life and experiencing life and living life to death, but the body leads the way. My mother, you could say she was in love with Roger Federer. When she was about 68, she said, you know, she was really in a, a period of thoughtful reflection because she wanted someone to share her life with 
but she didn't necessarily want to compromise living her own life to share it with another person. But since she was a tennis lover, she decided to rank available prospects um, in a bracket system. And um, Roger made it into the quarterfinals. <laughs> she said, I don't know if he's going to the semis. <laughs> Which explains that level of devotion, why she would try to go to so many of his matches. And one time at the US Open, she got down on her knees and hands and crawled through a sea of legs to get to the fence in which Robert, um, Roger was warming up and she popped up in front of people and held her tennis ball to the fence and he signed it and their fingers touched. <laughs> and she would go like this when she's telling the story. <laughs> and so when she was dying and in her bed that she would never leave for the rest of her days, and the French Open was on, and Roger and Nadal were playing, and I'd tell her about it, she would stop me short and she goes, I don't want to hear any of that. That's not where I'm going. Don't talk to me about that. You don't bring anything into this room that's not about my process. When your body is leading the way, your focus is your focus narrows, and you let go and release all that you do not need to hold on to. And your journey becomes clearer. My mother showed me what a thin spiritual place dying is. Instead of Roger and her focus on her grandkids and the travels that she'd want to do, she brought people in who would talk to her about spirituality and about a God she was curious about, and mostly to pray. And it wasn't the words of the prayer or the form of the prayer. It was the peace of the prayer, the posture of prayer. She would find meaning that held her and guided her like a rope when you can't see your way, but you could feel your way. My mother showed me how when you're dying, you spend time again with the people you love. Now there's this process called life review, where you go through the different moments in your life and you figure out what did that moment teach you or offer you? But this life review was a little bit different. Because normally when she had shared of her life, it was to teach me something. Help me understand who I was and where I came from, who I should be in the world. And this life review was just for her. It was all the moments when she was with people she loved, who loved her in return. Oh, the boyfriend she talked about how they made her feel, and the music she danced to, and she would hold her arms in her bed and sway. And I saw my mother at 16. Reminds me, death is a great time for a party. I know it might sound funny, but it really is. And there was a wonderful woman, Fran, at my last congregation. Oh, Fran. Fran, if she was a pig, would have been called a runt. She was born early, under four pounds. Things didn't fully develop properly, and so she always, from birth, had compromised lungs. And when she was in the hospital and dying, we knew it was close. And so we gathered together her family, but really her church family, and me, and we brought balloons, and cake, and food, and Fran was joyous to be again with people she loved. It's not so much about eating as savoring, and knowing that you are held, truly held in that transition. And she passed the next day. My mother showed me 
that you should die free. Die free. So for over two decades, my mother lived just, just above desperate poverty. That has a way of holding you down and forcing you to make choices you don't want to make. And as part of that time, she was trying to find a full life despite her mental illnesses and her deep trauma. And because of her mental illness, she was under a court guardianship for 15 years. And boy, did she want to be free. And one of the last things that she did in her last year of life was find a way to be emancipated. It was hard and difficult work. Really difficult, especially when you don't have much money. And the day before she died, the night before she died, she got the court papers that she was emancipated. What does it take What spiritual work and life work does it take to be free, to die free? My mother taught me and showed me what it means to say goodbye. So my mother was blessed with four kids, and three of us were with her for the whole journey. But my oldest sister and my mother, they didn't have an easy relationship. And my mother had said to my other siblings, I don't want her to know. I just don't want her to know. And I was thinking about this, and I thought, I can't be in right relationship with my sister if our mother dies and she was never even told she was dying. So I told her and I gave her the address and my sister flew out there, went and showed up unexpectedly and my mother heard her voice and said, let her in. And I wasn't there, but from what I've been told, they had the conversation they needed to have. The conversation that went, like this, I do love you, but you've never understood me, and you certainly never embraced me. And I still love you. Sometimes you have to say the goodbye that you can say. Say the goodbye that's available to you. One of the very last things that my mother ever said to me, holding my hands, was, don't go. I had to come back. I actually was leading a wedding for a congregant here and knew it was time. And I looked at her and her don't go, and I said, it's okay. Do you know why it's okay, Mom? She said, why? I said, because I love you. We shared all these years together, and you are written on the tablet of my heart. And I carry you with you with me wherever I go. We are never apart. And I said, am I on the tablet of your heart too? Am I always in your heart? And she said, yes. I said, then, then we're always apart. Our love is always here. And she said, that's true. And we said, I love each other. And then I left. Sometimes you say the goodbye you can say. And you work to get to the best goodbye you can. What allows us to reconcile being alive and having to die? It's by completing the work of living by savoring life and living it, by having meaningful relationships, by building a legacy as one can, and by loving where you can and saying goodbye 
and letting your body lead you. Mary Oliver, the great saint, talks about savoring this world and how gorgeous it is. Makes me wake up and appreciate it anew every day. And she writes about death. May I go through that door with curiosity into, can, can I go through that, go with curiosity through that door into that dark cottage? My dear ones, may we recognize and support each other in thinking through how to die well, to do the tender work, to courageously support each other in this spiritual work, to hold each other in being courageous and full of curiosity. Our Unitarian Universalist faith offers us two great promises the Unitarian side, that we are part of one indivisible whole. When we put my mother's ashes in the ground, it was a return. One of our former interns, Kimberly Wilczewski, had a dying congregant, an old man who she loved. And she brought her little baby <laughs> who was just born a few months ago, and she put him on the old man's chest. And she said, this baby just came from where you're going. So he's going to whisper about where you're headed for just you to hear. And the baby took the old man's face in his little hands and went, welcome home. And our universalist faith talks about a love without end. And I'll tell you, with my mother's passing, there has been undiminished love. More and more love, in fact. May this journey home be held by the love that remains. May it be so. And may we do this courageous, religious heart work together. Amen. Thank you.